Thank you for being here with us this morning. It's, it's glad to be with you uh, in our 40 days of prayer. I'm so happy and thrilled to see how it's affecting my own life, but also other people's lives as I hear your guys' personal stories about what it's like to go through these 40 days, how you've been experiencing growth through these 40 days. And so today we're going to be looking into uh, the five dimensions of prayer. But before we get there, let's just pray. Let's lift up our needs. Let's, let's practice prayer, right? We're in 40 days of prayer. It's, uh, it's a good thing to practice this right now. So let's pray. Yeah, God, we just want to bring before you the needs of our church, the needs of the community, the needs of the world, God. And so we just pray, God, those who are sick in our congregation uh, and those who are needing of a, a touch of healing from you, God, we just pray that you'd be with them. And so, Lord, we just lift them up to you and we say, God, would you be their healer? Would you be their comforter? Would you be their guidance? We pray for those who can't be with us this morning, that you would be with them, uh, giving them fellowship, giving them uh, just the closeness of you and the closeness of community wherever they are. Lord, we pray that you would just reach out to them. And we pray that you would be uh, with us here at Parkview as we continue to press in, lean deeper into just how we can form a deep relationship with you through prayer. And so we pray that you would just be with us in growth. And God, we pray for the things happening around the world. We pray for the war in Ukraine, which, which is hitting one year. And we just pray that you would just continue to be sovereign over this issue, that you would reign supreme and that you would make a way to resolve this conflict. And God, we pray for the revival that's happening in the States, God. We love to see how you are moving amongst your people. And we say, Lord, just keep going. Thank you so much that we get to bear witness to this period of revival in the States. And so, God, we just pray for all these things in your name. Amen. Well, it's been pretty cool, actually, to see that revival. Maybe I just want to go there for a second. It's kind of cool. Have you heard about it? It's called the Osbury Revival. A bunch of college students met in the chapel to worship God, and they just stayed after And they just kept praising his name, and it grew into a great, magnificent revival down in that one college. So much so that they've actually, they've told them, hey, you got to stop meeting on Monday because it's a fire hazard. And so that's so good to see how God has been moving down the States. And it's also cool just to see how God has been moving here. And I want to talk about five dimensions of prayer. And to start it out, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been to a mirror maze? like one at a carnival or something like that. The ones where you walk through that maze of reflections and you just keep seeing like different images of yourself. They're super confusing, you know, they give me a bit of a headache. And as I walk through them, as that headache starts to, you know, spiral up, I start to walk into the mirrors a bit more because I, I just don't know where I'm going. And it's funny, when you see toddlers go through that, they have no perspective of mirrors at all, and so they're just bumping into everything. It's kind of funny. I invite you to look that up maybe later today if you need to laugh. But it's, it's weird. There's different angles of yourself because it's all one giant mirror room. And you see, when we see God, we see all the different angles of him. Although not in a confusing way like a mirror maze can be, but rather in a perceptive way, in a loving way, that we actually get to say, oh, I'm fully surrounded by the presence of him, by his reflections in these different images. And the thing is, we need to see God as the Trinity, that we have one God in three persons. And that God is a multidimensional God. We have to see him as these different dimensions. He's not confined to our human limitations. I can't comprehend his glory just by words. And so rather to understand him and the persons of the Trinity, we have to say God is one God in three persons. And this is evident in a few different ways. The first way is that we see God in the evidence of creation. We see God in creation. Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understand understood from what has been made. So all of creation declares his glory. It sings his worship. When I look out into creation, I can say, God made it. And God's evidence is all around it. In the systems of creation, 
in the way that the food chain is for creation, that everything is well-sustained, properly nourished, well-maintained. It shows his glory, but also his love, that we can survive here on earth because God maintains it so perfectly. We see it in God's creation. All creation speaks his name, his purpose, and how perfectly it is put together shows the Father. And you see, we try to understand it more. We try to hone it in more, saying, okay, where are the limits of God's glory in this creation? We try to define it, but we can't. And Job 11, 7 to 9 says this, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. As we try to understand the universe and we try to say, where is the limits? How well can we know the earth? How well can we know God's creation? Can we define his limitations? We can't. As far as we try to explore the sea, it's still deeper. As far as we go out in the universe, it's still longer. God's wonder, his glory is defined in creation. And it's also defined as we look to see Jesus in the incarnation. We see the multidimensional God in Jesus' incarnation. We see the one who was sent by the Father, the one who came in flesh and blood to be with us. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The one came so that he would be flesh and blood with us. The disciples, they saw him. They knew him. They had their feet washed by him. They saw his pierced side, felt the holes in his hand. Jesus, his incarnation, him being made human here on earth, shows the multidimensional God. You see, the disciples witnessed his glory in flesh and blood. Even so, they saw him when they left earth in Acts 1.9, that he would ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father so that he could continue to advocate for us, continue to work for us, continue to love us. So much so that even Hebrews chapter 12 talks about his advocacy, him being a team player for us. And so he brings peace and grace in his works in heaven. He brings peace and grace. Revelation 1, 4 says this, grace and peace to you from him who is seated, who, him who is, him who was, and him who is to come. That the one who already came, the one who resides in heaven currently, and the one who's waiting to come back for us, he is the one who is consistently giving us peace and grace. But even more is we see God as multidimensional as we see the Holy Spirit moving among us. John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and he will be with you forever. The other advocate is among us right now. He's present in the leading and guiding of our lives, even to the most mundane of tasks, that the Holy Spirit would be guiding and leading us in this. And he resides within us. This advocate is consistently with us. It, the Spirit goes on to support the disciples in the whole book of Acts, and we can see that that same Spirit that did all those great works with the disciples in the book of Acts is the same Spirit that guides us today. John 14, 17 to 18 even says, The Spirit of truth is that the world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. And then Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. And so the multidimensional God, Jesus is saying, I will not leave you, but rather I send the Spirit who is God and will be with you. You're not left as orphans, but rather he is with you. And so I tell you, our God is a multidimensional God. And the Father watches over us. Jesus walks beside us and the Holy Spirit resides in us. And so with that, we can say that because God is a multidimensional God, 
I am never alone. How does this play out, though? I want you to listen to a psalm here. Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12, and and listen to how the psalmist is saying that God has never left him. And in the same ways, God has never left you. And you probably could relate to the psalmist because he goes in a variety of directions over his life through his next few verses. And so Psalm 139, 7 to 12 says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for the darkness as light to you. God is close to you no matter where you are because he's not limited. He doesn't go to one person at a time. There's no wait line. There's no kiosk. He's with you. And so we cannot hide from him. If you're in there in your Bibles, I want you to look at specifically verse 8. Verse 8 says, If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. What does this mean, though? You know, with the youth group, we actually looked at this verse, and so I think it's kind of cool that I got to bring this here now. We looked at this verse and said, even on your mountaintop experiences, God is with you. When you're having the best week of your life, God is with you. That's awesome, right? But then he goes, even when I have the worst time of my life, God is with me. He's never left in that moment. Even more is just to look away from the NIV and to the ESV. Listen to what the ESV says. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are with me. I was teaching the youth Sheol. Can you guys say Sheol with me? Sheol. It means the realm of the dead. It means death itself. And the psalmist is saying, even if I die, or I've made my bed, or my resting place, or I've settled down in the realm of the dead, you're not the one to abandon me. Isn't that powerful? Even as ascend to the heavens, God will be there. And we know that. God reigns in heaven. He, he'll be with us. But even when I go and I make my bed, my resting place, set my house up in the realm of the dead, the place where God doesn't even enter, he is still with me there. You know, God is with you. God is with you. From the top to the bottom, there's no point in hiding from it because you are never alone when a multidimensional God is with you. And so, we need to also see our prayers in a multidimensional way. I think this sermon's kind of funny because uh, the new Marvel movie came out, and they're going into like the multiverse and the dimensional stuff, and it's kind of crazy. I feel like I'm seeing it everywhere in movies now. And so to see this sermon uh, pop up on our roster and to say, hey, I get to preach it, I've been trying my best to try to connect those two dots, but I can't. Uh, <laughs> and again, probably to that point of God's limitations can't be honed in, I can't really speak to something uh, that I am still trying to fathom the mysteries of. But to know how to pray in five dimensions is a thing that's actually practical. We can reach into it and we can look into it to say, God, I need to be able to pray to you in a variety of ways. In my own prayer life, I need to pray to you as you are. That you are one God, but you exist in three persons. That you are Father above, Jesus beside, and the Holy Spirit within. And so let's look at it. First, we've got to look back to the cross. You see, Jesus is the foundational block of our faith. The one who dies and com- comes back to life to say he loves us and is now the one transforming our lives. And so if we look back to the cross first, we see Jesus' incarnation. The one who said, I will die for you, but not just that, but also rise again. First Peter uh, 1, 18 to 19 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, 
but it was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemishes or defects. And so the first call is that we should always be looking back to the one who died for us, the foundation of our faith, the one we follow because he did such great things. We could say in our prayers, Jesus, you've already been this for us. You've already showed us how deeply God loves us, how costly evil and sin is that you would have to die for us, and how we are already completely forgiven. And so when we walk into prayer knowing that Jesus has already done all these great things on the cross, it changes the way we come to prayer. That we wouldn't come with our griefs or our heavy burdens to say, man, I don't even need to pray at all because it's too much. No, Jesus has already been there. It's not too much. He's hit the cross for us. He's died and rose again for us. And so we can pray knowing that we can look back to the cross, that he has already done such great things. And our prayers, our prayers are one of the things that he's going to do too. And then we can go and we can say, looking forward to my father's loving face. I look forward to my, loving, my father's loving face when I pray. And we've talked about this for a bit. We talked about how we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then we call him Father. And that Father name is such a deep and personal relationship that we could say, You are my Father. You have a close and intimate relationship with me. You're one that I can trust. God wants us to see him as a Father. But not just like any earthly father, but a better father. You know, I think back to my dad when I talk about this, because my dad's a great guy. I love my dad. But um, he, he once said to me, uh, Liam, you know I'm not a perfect dad. I said, why? You're crazy. You're, you're a pretty good dad. He said, I'm not perfect. You know, there are things I've messed up on, probably in raising you. I said, well, don't look at it like that, dad. You did a great job. But he's right. You know, I think back to it. He wasn't perfect, he's a pretty good dad. But my father in heaven is perfect. And I get to think, man, there's nothing that he's messed up on. There's no point where I can say you have flawed or you have issues. You've raised me in an improper way. No, I can say, God, in every single way you have never let me down. And I can hold true to that character that you will never let me down. And so I can look up to my father's face and say, you are caring, considerate, compassionate, consistent, and a fully capable father. Isn't that great? Our father in heaven is fully capable. He is consistent. He is caring. He is considerate. And he is so close to us. And so if you pray in this way, you speak it in your prayers. It will completely change the way that you pray when you see God as your father. Romans 8, 15 to 17 says this, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you receive brought, your, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs to God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If we see God as our father, as our Abba, our prayers reflect that, knowing that we can come to him with anything that we need or anything that is on our, in our burdens. And when you see God like a father, you pray to him like a father. If you see God as a distant person, you're going to pray in distance. If you see God fearfully, you're going to pray with fear, but rather we can see God as a father and pray in such a close and intimate way. God wants us to see him like such, and so we have personal prayers, and we cry out, Abba, Father, and it's a personal way. We can be close to him and see him as a relational father. And we see him out and we cry out that it would be passionate. We can cry out in our emotional states, going into a deeper intimacy with God and saying, this is on my heart. This is the raw state that I'm in. I really just need this off my chest, God. And we can pray in our tears of joy, but also our tears of sadness. 
we know that he is a close God. He's not going to stand up and say, hey, this is too awkward. This is too much. I'm going to walk out the door. But rather, he's leaning in in those moments where we're close to him. And we can also say by his spirit, we have partnership with him. Each time we pray, we, we bring out more of his spirit. Romans 8.26 says this, in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. Man, there are often times where I don't know what to pray. And I just say, Spirit, you know. You know what I need already. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to phrase it. I don't even know what to pray for sometimes. But Spirit, you already know. Through my wordless groans, through my mumbling and stuttering, you know. And I want to partner with you to pray that. The third one is, I look inward to Jesus living inside of me. Jesus lives in you, and you make the choice to follow him. He's not just in heaven watching over you, but like I said, Jesus beside me. Jesus is consistently with you as you pray. And the promise that you've made in your relationship with you, he's, he's not walking away. Like I said, he's not going to throw up his hands and say, this is too awkward, I'm heading out the door, but rather he's saying, hey, let me, let me just throw my hand around you and pray deeper with you. Jesus, wants, Jesus knows you exactly like who you are already. And I said that deeper intimacy where you can be raw. Jesus already knows it. He's just waiting for you to bring it up. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in, the faith, uh, are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. If you know yourself, it's easy to open up with Jesus and to know how you need to grow with him. But the thing is, we have to be vulnerable and say, Jesus, I want to let you into my life. I want to be intimate in the good and the bad so that I can grow with you. Jesus wants to hear the good parts of your life. I think it's pretty easy to say, thanks God for all all these blessings, all of these gifts. It's a little harder to say, Jesus, here's my faults. Here's the hard stuff. Here's the stuff where I just need you to intervene. But he already knows that. Like I said, we have a multidimensional God where he already knows you completely of who you are. He is just waiting for you to bring it up. He's waiting to jump in with you. Think of it like this. Uh, I deeply love my wife, Rhiannon. But if I never talk to her, I have no idea what's happening with her. No clue. And our relationship would probably suffer pretty bad if I never said a word to her. You know, since Jesus wants to have a deep relationship with him, while I want to have a deep relationship with him, he wants to have a deep relationship with me, I need to talk to him. Because just like my marriage, if I don't talk to Rhiannon, I'm probably going to be sleeping on the couch a few nights. And so I need to grow and I need to have deep, intimate conversations with Jesus. Like in the same way a marriage... I need to show my wife, you know, some of the hardships that I face. You know, when I have a hard day, uh, I'm running to her and I'm saying, hey, you know, it's rough. Like, it's rough. I'm, if I'm going to just eat potato chips on the couch tonight, I need you to know why. We need to have deep, intimate relationships with Jesus. Saying, hey, Jesus, you know, <laughs> I want to eat potato chips on the couch tonight. Here's why I'm doing it. I need you to be in with this. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And like I said, Jesus already knows it. Jesus is already ready to hand out that mercy. He's holding it. He's got a nice basket. And he's saying, all you've got to do is say it. I got this gift already. And I know exactly what you're saying. All I need you to do is bring it up. Bring the confessions, bring the hurt, bring the need for healing. Jesus knows that he wants to dig in with it. And while we look inward, we also have to realize this. That I look around and ask the Holy Spirit to use me. We are not just self-centered beings. Jesus wants a deep personal relationship with us, but he's also saying... Hey, there's other people too. I want to get to know them. I want to keep building the kingdom. And so we ask the Holy Spirit to use us, 
to deeply care for those around us, to follow him in loving those and building the kingdom here. Romans 6.13 says this, Do not offer any part of yourself as, uh, to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of him, yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Offer yourself up as an instrument of righteousness. God wants to do good things in you. And we must partner with the Holy Spirit. If he wants to partner with us, we should say, hey, I want to partner with you. Saying, Lord, use me. Say in your prayers this week, week, use me. Use me to accomplish this. Use me in this need. Use me to affect the people around me. I often say, Lord, this is hard. You know, I need, I have this great need. Don't just answer it and say it's all done, but rather use me in the answering. Use me to accomplish these goals. It goes hand in hand also as we look forward to my future in faith. That you would look forward to your future in faith as you pray. We work with the Spirit to accomplish the Lord's task. Not on our own, but we need to know that His works are good. His works lead to a greater future for our own personal development as we lead out in faith, but also as we bring those and equip those around us. And so we look forward and we ask him, what should I put first today? Lord, what do I need to put first on my plate? Who am I to reach out to? How are you going to use me in my community today? What should I say in that meeting? How should I respond to this issue that arose yesterday? We need the confidence that when we ask God for these things, the Father will be delivering them. Philippians 1, 6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the end, uh, to the day of Jesus Christ. God is consistent. He's going to be consistent. He's going to continue to work in great faithfulness to us if we work in great faithfulness to him until the day that Jesus comes. And then... He's not giving up on you. He's going to say, hey, come sit at the table and let's celebrate. We've got to look forward to our future in faith. Not saying, hey, tomorrow, that's a different thing. I got, I got it on my own, God. But rather saying, you've done so much already. I can look back as we see Jesus on the cross. I can look around in all the ways that you moved in my life and say, I'm looking forward to a great faith and a great future with you. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you would be present in our prayers in these ways that we would be able to see you not just as one God who, who just sits on the distance, on the sidelines, but rather one God who is three persons in every single aspect of our life. Lord, that we would be able to pray knowing so much that you are around us in everything. Lord, when we're having the best time of our, our lives, that we know that you're with us. And when, when we make our bed in Sheol, when we feel in the depths, you are still there. And so I pray that we would just lean in into praying these ways this week. That we would guide us in this. Holy Spirit reminding us how to pray in such a way that reveals our love for you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.